it's getting late. Better be getting home. It's quicker if we cut through here. What's this guy up to? Let's get out of here. The world is a scary place sometimes. Where's the car? What's this guy up to? He hasn't done anything yet, but can't the cops arrest him for attempt? Attempt to do what? What is the target offense? Without proof of a specific target offense, there can be no attempt liability. There ought to be a law. But why? And what should it say? The history of laws designed to criminalize harmless conduct is not pretty. Here is Richmond, Virginia, circa 1866. Under the Black Codes passed immediately after the Civil War's end, freedmen were legally required to sign labor contracts with their former masters on pain of being convicted of the crime of vagrancy. Convicted vagrants were subject to fines that, being penniless, they could only pay off by service to their former masters, or in the case of these defiant freedmen, to the state of Virginia. Post-Reconstruction era vagrancy laws tended to expand to criminalize a wide range of conduct, or even non-conduct, such as loitering, which is essentially just standing someplace, and also prowling, which is essentially just not standing but moving around from place to place. The city of Jacksonville arrested two interracial couples for driving around. They were convicted under an ordinance that stated, Rogues and vagabonds or dissolute persons who go about begging, common gamblers, persons who use juggling or unlawful games or plays, common drunkards, common night thieves, lewd, wanton, and lascivious persons, persons wandering or strolling about from place to place without any lawful purpose or object, habitual loafers, disorderly persons, persons neglecting all lawful business and habitually spending their time by frequenting houses of ill fame, gaming houses, or places where alcoholic beverages are sold or served, persons able to work but habitually living upon the earnings of their wives or minor children shall be deemed vagrants and upon conviction shall be punished by 90 days imprisonment, $500 fine, or both. The U.S. Supreme Court struck down this ordinance as a violation of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, which was enacted in the Reconstruction era. Anticipating the constitutional infirmity of vagrancy laws, the drafters of the Model Penal Code tried to articulate a defensible, modernized alternative. The Model Penal Code drafters believed there was a legitimate public concern where, for example, police were aware of situations such as a known pickpocket loitering in a crowded station, a non-resident lurking in a doorway looking to see if anyone is watching, an unknown man standing in a dark alley with no apparent business, in the early morning a man examining an unoccupied dwelling from behind a tree. Must the police wait until the person under suspicion actually attempts a crime? That could tie up a lot of police personnel. The Model Penal Code drafters proposed the following solution. A person commits a violation if he loiters or prowls in a place at a time or in a manner not usual for law-abiding individuals under circumstances that warrant alarm for the safety of persons or property in the vicinity. The key element is conduct that warrants alarm on the part of a reasonable member of the public. The actor would not be subject to arrest if she can explain herself to the officer's satisfaction, and a trial would have a defense if she offers an explanation that would have dispelled the alarm had it been believed. 
The city of Los Angeles arrested Mr. Edward Lawson on the authority of an ordinance fashioned on the model penal code. The U.S. Supreme Court held the ordinance unconstitutional. Mr. Lawson has a right to walk the public ways late at night, even if that might cause alarm to other Los Angelinos. The ordinance violated the fundamental principle of legality. No crime without law. The vagueness of the ordinance failed to give citizens fair warning of what they are free to do, and it lent itself to arbitrary and discriminatory law enforcement practices. In the subsequent case of City of Chicago versus Morales, the Supreme Court of the United States revisited the subject. The core provision of the Chicago Ordinance stated that any person who remains in any public place with no apparent purpose shall be guilty of loitering. Loitering is a misdemeanor. Because of the vagueness of the no apparent purpose clause, the ordinance was held unconstitutional. However, a majority of the court expressed apparent readiness to approve a revised ordinance. Any person who, as a member of a large collection of obviously brazen, insistent, and lawless gang members and hangers-on, intimidates and thereby frightens any resident, shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. The plurality, with the concurrence of two other justices, wrote, we have no doubt that a law that directly prohibited such intimidating conduct would be constitutional. The circumstance of a gang presence becomes incidental under this revision. Intimidating conduct has long been punishable as a crime against the person. The city of Chicago was trying to criminalize the congregation of gang members who had not individually engaged in acts of intimidation, but whose gathering itself made neighbors anxious, lest they encroach upon a gang's turf. Our own Georgia Supreme Court has addressed the general question in the post-Morales case of Johnson v. athens Clark County. A person commits the offense of loitering or prowling when he is in a place at a time or in a manner not usual for law-abiding individuals under circumstances that warrant a justifiable and reasonable alarm or immediate concern for the safety of persons or property in the vicinity. The ordinance is similar to the Model Penal Code provision and to the Los Angeles Ordinance held unconstitutional in Colander versus Lawson. Nonetheless, the Georgia Supreme Court approved the language up to the additional bit about drug activity, the bit under which the defendant had been charged. The additional bit failed to give fair warning under Morales, the court held. Query whether the entire ordinance is unconstitutional after Colander and Morales. The model penal code formulation dates back to a period when electronic surveillance of public places was uncommon. The drafters assumed that the public had to rely on police on patrol to interact in a timely but liberty-respecting way with persons exhibiting worrisome behaviors. Today, we have become accustomed to CCTV cameras on every downtown light pole. This image is taken from the website of a company that markets a loiter detector, which alerts private security in case its algorithm detects signs of antisocial tendencies. The property owner need not be involved at all. Can surveillance drones be far behind? Public authorities today might find the use of this sort of technology to be preferable to defending constitutionally unsound laws drawn, quoting Morales, 
to set a net large enough to catch all possible offenders and leave it to the courts to step inside and say who could be rightfully detained and who should be let at large. What a net woven of words cannot achieve, a network of data is increasingly called upon to do.